Okay, I'm going to try this. Welcome to um, our uh, second luncheon. Uh, please join me in welcoming Catherine Ryland. Catherine is the director of the Wisconsin Idea Seminar. Um, I first met Catherine when she was uh, probably, what, 20 years ago? Yeah, 2001. Yeah when you did World Languages Day at the Union, and then she went on to be with African Studies. Catherine's going to lead us on a travelogue and take us and take a look back at the program's early years in the mid-1980s to what has transpired today and um, to create the UW-Madison Seminar and why it is still relevant. Welcome, Thank Catherine. Thank you so much, Ruthie. I was, I was thrilled when Ruthie um, invited me. As, as she mentioned, I met Ruthie actually when I was still an undergraduate at UW-Madison and when I was asked to uh, create these large-scale uh, language programs for high school students to highlight the fact that at the time, UW-Madison was teaching 60 languages. And Ruthie was one of the first um, kind of event planners that I, who I had met. And she just has been a great source of inspiration and uh, mentorship. So thank you, Ruthie. And I'm glad to see a number of familiar faces in the room, and so I feel very, very welcomed. So because I see a few familiar faces, has anyone um, attended the Wisconsin Idea Seminar over the years? I know that um, Jeanette did. Anyone else? So we have one. Well, great. I'm glad to have. Um, can, you hear you? can you hear me now? How is this? You have, you have a microphone. I do have a. Is this? How about this? Is this, is this a little bit better? Thank you. All right. And let me know if I'm not, if I'm speaking too fast or um, quietly, because I have a, I tend to speak quietly. Um, please let me know. So, um, so the Wisconsin Idea Seminar is one of the, my favorite topics to, to talk about. And so I, I'm guessing that you'll uh, feel my enthusiasm. But in a nutshell, the Wisconsin Idea Seminar is a program for academic staff and faculty to get on a bus for five days to learn about the state of Wisconsin, um, to get a sense of the Wisconsin idea, to get a sense of what the Wisconsin idea looks like in action, and to get a sense of the places and spaces where many of our students come from. The goals of the seminar um, haven't really changed um, since its inception in 1985, and basically it's to gain a deeper um, knowledge of the cultural, educational, uh, industrial realities of the state to create mutual understanding between the folks of Wisconsin and the university, to see the, how, the United, how the university is connected throughout the state, and to understand and get a sense of the public mission of the university. And most of the people who attend the, the seminar are people who are new to the university, and many of them are new to the state. Uh, sometimes we have people who are born and raised in Wisconsin, but the seminar does reveal Wisconsin in different ways, um, even for uh, people who are born and raised here. Uh, we, throughout the seminar, we're thinking about um, you know, getting out, talking about, our, or learning about outreach and public service. Um, seeing the university at work throughout Wisconsin, meeting Wisconsin folks, understanding um, their lives and the work that they do, learning about the geography of Wisconsin. And one of the biggest um, things that people um, enjoy and really find value in the Wisconsin Idea Seminar is creating community within the folks on the bus. And so we have um, about 40 to 45 people spending five days together, and it's across disciplines. So you'll, you'll have a hydrologist sitting next to the director of opera, sitting next to um, you know a Russianist, sitting next to a geologist, and so those uh, mixtures of disciplines and sharing their their thoughts and their perceptions as they travel around the state. Those friendships that start on the bus often um, last uh, for a lifetime. The themes of the seminar also haven't really changed since its inception in 1985. We're thinking of, as we travel around the state, we're thinking about the state in terms of agriculture, native nations, K through 12 education, the environment, and each stop engages on one of those themes. As I, um, as I mentioned, the seminar started back in 1985. Some of you might have, uh, might recognize a few of these faces. Uh, the, I'm someone who loves history, I'm someone who loves context, and so if you bear with me, I'm going to make probably a shorter story even longer. And I'm going to start um, with Phil Certain. Everyone here probably you know, remembers uh, Phil Certain, former uh, dean of LNS. And 
he's from Georgia, the great state of Georgia. So why am I talking about Georgia here in Wisconsin, uh, talking about the Wisconsin idea? Well, um, when he was in high school, there were uh, folks who felt in Georgia that high school students should really have a sense of their state. Um, the high school students should um, get on a bus, maybe for five days, and understand the realities of the state of Georgia. And so Phil Certain, as a young, maybe 15, 16 year old, was invited to be on this inaugural bus experience called Bright Stars. And so Bright Stars um, was an annual event for a number of years. I'm not sure how long it uh, lasted, but uh, it, it was a high school program for uh, students in Georgia. So the University of Georgia, sometime in the 1970s, thought, you know what? We really like that high school program that brings people on a bus for five days to learn about the state of Georgia. I, like, we think that our faculty and staff at the University of Georgia should also understand they're also a land-grant state, um, that, the, that our faculty and staff at the University of Georgia should also get a, on the bus for five days and learn about the realities of the state of Georgia. Fast forward to the early 80s, folks from the University of Georgia were at a conference with folks from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they said, we have an idea for you. And um, in 1984, 1985, Peg Geisler, the first director of the seminar, was tasked with creating um, something that she called the Wisconsin Idea Seminar, which brought uh, faculty on a bus for five days to learn about the state. And so it all starts with uh, Phil Certain, a 15-year-old Phil Certain. Um, that's what I like to say. So this was um, the first itinerary back in 1985 that Peg Geisler put together. And very importantly, um, how much beer uh, should be purchased um, at some point in the, on their travels. But as you can see, she was really thinking about the state and those big themes, thinking about agriculture, thinking about industry, thinking about Native nations, and thinking about um, food and how we enjoy um, different aspects of Wisconsin. So this is the first um, itinerary. Um, in 1985. And then in 1986, um, I found this. I love the archives, and thankfully, my predecessors were uh, careful archivists and kept a lot of things. I found this newspaper clipping of a very young, a 33 year old uh, Feingold um, in, in where they met him at the Capitol. And also that year, they also met with uh, David Prosser, who at the time was serving in the Wisconsin State Assembly. And uh, I really uh, value meeting um, the, the great women who created the, the seminar and, and kept it going for so many years. And so after I did my first seminar in 2016, I had lunch. So here is uh, Peg Geisler, um, first director, founding director, and then um, Miriam Simmons, who directed it for many, many years. And that might have been um, the, the leader when our Wisconsin Year alumna went on it. And then uh, Joyce Krim took it over after she retired. And then I came on board on, in 2016. And as Ruthie had mentioned, I had, um, I had done my undergrad. I was born and raised um, in Wisconsin. Um, I'm uh, Guatemalan-American. My mother is from Guatemala. And my dad is from central Wisconsin. And so I've spent a lifetime thinking about Wisconsin in different lenses and welcoming my international family and folks from Guatemala um, to Wisconsin. So I've always thought about Wisconsin um, through multiple lenses. And when I, I heard about this job, I was encouraged to apply. And it's just been a joy ever since. And it's just been a really uh, remarkable experience to also meet uh, the women who um, carried the, the seminar for so many years. So when I came on board um, in 2016, I was, ex I was excited to read about the history of the seminar. And as you might have um, read in some of the notes, uh, the seminar has been uh, faithfully underwritten by the Evie Foundation. And so when I came on board, I had to read um, uh, Bill Evie's uh, um, autobiography. And Bill Evie, as, as we all know, was editor of the Cap Times for um, the founding member, founding editor of the Cap Times for many, many years. And he also founded uh, Madison's first commercial radio uh, station. And in the 40s and the 50s, Bill Evie had a program. It was not only um, a radio program, but it also was a, um, a column in the Cap Times called Hello, Wisconsin. And it was a column where he addressed um, news of the day, topical um, information that was of great concern to Wisconsinites. And in his radio program of the same name, Hello, Wisconsin, he often welcomed uh, people who um, do the, the daily work of keeping cities and states alive. And so he may uh, routinely invite someone like the chief of police um, sitting down with 
the head of sanitation to learn about what are the challenges um, that their jobs are facing and how are they finding solutions to address those problems. And when I read about that and read about his Hello Wisconsin column, I felt that that was really the spirit of the Wisconsin idea that we get on a bus for five days, we're not, um, we're not talking, we're not, we've left our soapboxes at home, and we're really here to, to greet the state of Wisconsin, to say hello uh, to Wisconsin, and to get a sense of what people are concerned about, what are the problems that they're engaging, and what solutions are they, are they finding for those problems. So inspired by uh, Bill Evu and his Hello Wisconsin, and so that's become also our, our logo. Uh, also when I came on board, uh, I've, I needed a narrative frame um, to, to kind of put together the, the seminar, and water seemed to be the perfect uh, narrative frame. Wisconsin, the, even the state of Wisconsin is defined by water. We have the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River. We have the Great Lakes, and without those bodies of water, we wouldn't have our shape um, that we've come to, to know and love of Wisconsin. So water became the, the narrative frame and a way for us to think about Wisconsin in those different lenses that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, Wisconsin is also home to many water-intensive industries, and it was a way for us to also think about that. So as I, as I mentioned, my predecessors had um, built many uh, different itineraries uh, throughout their years, and I gave them names. I ended up giving them names based on our, our water narratives. And so I created the Bay Tour, or I named the Bay Tour, uh, which the Bay Tour um, goes to the, uh, up to the east, up the Fox River Valley, into Door County, down the lake board, the eastern lake board of Wisconsin, and then back to Madison. Uh, we have the river tour, uh, which is one of my, my favorites. Um, here's a, this is a photograph that I took off the, on a Belvedere in Trempeleau, Wisconsin, looking out at the Mississippi River. And both of our, we've had two river tours since I've um, been on board, and both river tours were thinking about uh, different uh, Wisconsin cities um, as river cities and putting those river cities in conversation with each other. So thinking about Milwaukee, um, Stevens Point, Plover, uh, La Crosse, Viroqua, and seeing how these communities, how they've um, over time faced the river, how have they engaged the rivers that run through their community, how they haven't engaged um, those rivers, and looking at the evolution of those relationships with rivers across Wisconsin. And finally, the, the Big Lake tour going all the way to uh, Lake Superior. And this is one of the, the longest, um, the longest uh, seminars, because we do go to the very, very tip of Wisconsin and all the way back down to Milwaukee. Another aspect that I was uh, really, um, that I felt really important to do since, it's going, since water is going to be our, our theme is to think about uh, embodied water experiences and how do we get folks actually touching the water, getting into the water. And here is a photograph um, from May of 2019 during our river tour. Thankfully we had uh, uh, a photographer um, and geographer, yeah, a photographer and geographer who um, has become an expert in uh, drone technology and brought his drone along. And so this is this afternoon when we started uh, a canoe trip on the Milwaukee River and thinking about the Milwaukee River as a place of recreation where it had not been a place of recreation for decades um, due to the, the high levels of pollution. Um, but here is um, a way of, of getting in touch with that, um, that waterscape in a city. And here we are, um, again, with using that drone technology of uh, the geographer is Christian Anderson. Uh, and here we are in canoes um, getting in touch with the water. Another aspect that I was uh, part of the seminar that I love, love to do is putting together our tour books. My predecessors, um, bless their hearts, um, had at the time um, you know, put together these really great binders, but they were very large, almost like five pound binders that they would you know, hand out uh, to folks getting on the bus. And I thought to myself, like, how do we, you know, how do we kind of, like, kind of get, get all that great information but in a, small, um, in a small size? And here's just for scale. Um, these tour books are very tiny, and so um, this is the this is the, the size of them. And so here's the the river tour and uh, the cover, which I was really pleased. I um, joined hands with um, folks from the Ho Chunk Nation to get permission to use um, their maps, where they've um, mapped out the names of the Wisconsin rivers in Ho Chunk, 
And I also changed the orientation. So this is Lake Michigan. And so representing some of the things that the Wisconsin idea does is presenting Wisconsin in other languages and presenting Wisconsin in other perspectives. And so that was our river tour um, cover. And the, the tour book um, includes not only the itinerary, not only maps, but also I commission mostly original essays by key people on campus and throughout the state who engage in Wisconsin in a variety of ways. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it's relevant, I've worked with um, uh, Native students to put together uh, language guides. We have a language guide for Ho-Chunk, we have a language guide for Ojibwe, and photography. So as people are, as we're traveling the state, they're able to engage different aspects of Wisconsin through the tour book. Uh, here's another tour book, again, another river tour, um, where I hand illustrated the rivers and again, joined hands with uh, folks from the Ho-Chunk Nation to use um, their language on the tour book. And I overlaid the illustration on um, handmade paper by a professor named Mary Hark from the School of Human Ecology, who's a, a paper artist, and she gave me permission to use um, her, uh, her paper for this endeavor, which I'm very uh, grateful for. And I also want to say a big thanks to the UW Cartography Lab and Map Library, who do a lot of work in uh, putting together the, the tour book and also doing the research for some of the mapping. And another way that we think about uh, traveling Wisconsin and thinking about Wisconsin is food. And one of the things that, one of my favorite things that I, I did um, my, during my first year is meet with Joan um, Houston Hall, the Director Emeritus of the Dictionary of American Regional English. And I said, Joan, I said, you know, I really want to, you know, somehow engage food words um, in the seminar. And she um, hand wrote uh, a list of great Wisconsin um, food that many people here will probably recognize, things like Charnina and Lefsa and Kringle and other things that I'm having a hard time reading this right now. But here is her handwritten um, uh, list of words, and one of the reasons why I was so inspired to think about this is through food, not only are you connecting with people, but we're also thinking about the waves of immigrants who've shaped um, Wisconsin. And throughout the seminar, we're also thinking about um, literally eating food. Uh, we have 15 meals that we plan through those five, um, five days, and when I work with um, food folks across the state, asking them to put menus together that really gesture towards the food of that location and to celebrate the food traditions of that location. And here we are in this um, photograph at the Rooted Spoon in Viroqua. And because it's you know big uh, Scandinavian heritage in that part of the state, asking her to put a, together a menu that gestures toward that those Scandinavian foods and flavors. And here's just another example of celebrating food and thinking about food. When we visited the United Nation in 2016, um, they gave us uh, dehydrated uh, white corn, which can be made into soups. And they have um, acres of uh, white corn that's very significant to them culturally. And they also cultivate it organically and otherwise on the Oneida, in the United Nation. So today I wanted to just kind of give you a, a snapshot of what the, the seminar can feel like and look like. And again, some of our, our narrative framing not only is water, but also stories of collaboration, ways that the University of Wisconsin-Madison has collaborated with folks across the state, and also the way people within the state collaborate with each other um, to find solutions to issues that they're facing. And so before we even leave Madison, um, I've again joined hands with um, folks in the Ho-Chunk Nation to think about the stories of the Four Lakes. So before we even leave campus, for us to get a sense of the significance of the land where we're studying and working and understanding that that, that land is ancestral and contemporary uh, land to the Ho-Chunk Nation. And so here we are at Picnic Point, um, which is you know, a, a trail that many people jog on and they you know, walk on, but to have that represented um, on the first day before we then leave campus, represented uh, with stories and context uh, from the Ho-Chunk Nation is really um, important and, and, and people really value that. And so here, um, here we are with um, Bill Quackenbush, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Ho-Chunk Nation. And he's been incredibly generous with his time and comes to Madison bright and early on that Monday uh, to do a cultural landscape walking tour of uh, Picnic Point and we walk all the way to the end. 
Uh, one year that we did this, this is from 2018, it was a very uh, strange morning where the, the fog was extremely dense. And here we are at Picnic Point in this relatively new exit row. And as you can see, the fog just completely um, covered the lake, so you can't even tell that we were at the lake shore. And moments after he finished talking, he invited um, uh, four singers to do, four Ho-Chunk singers to do a travel song and a friendship song. And the way that the fog and the acoustics just made it a really unforgettable um, experience. And here's another year that we're at uh, the edge of Picnic Point, and the fog is gone. It's a completely different uh, feeling at the tip of Picnic Point. But again, having um, Bill Quackenbush and and others just kind of ground our learning in the land, in the water, um, in the land that we do so much work on day to day. Another story uh, that was one of the highlights for many um, in our river tour was um, getting a sense of health and healing with Amish communities. Uh, many of you, um, has anyone ever been to Lafarge? So, oh good, we have two people. Uh, so Lafarge is home to the Lafarge Clinic, and within the Lafarge Medical Clinic is the Center for Special Children, um, which is uh, part of the clinic that focuses on um, the health and healing of mostly um, Amish and, and Mennonite children who are facing um, particular um, health needs. And one of the reasons that I um, chose to include this story was the, it, the integration of collaboration. So here we have um, Chris Saruji, who is um, a professor of pediatrics at UW-Madison. We have Jim DeLine, who is the founder of the Lafarge Medical Clinic, who founded it in the early 1980s. Um, he finished uh, med school, and he decided, let's find um, a space in Wisconsin that has um, kind of the, the least medical um, services, and Lafarge kind of seemed to be that place. And uh, here we have Mark Loudon, who is a professor of German and also speaks Pennsylvania Dutch, which is the language of, um, of many Amish people. And, and here's a, a midwife, um, Amanda, who's a midwife. But what I liked about this collaboration is that these three people, um, you know, you know UW-Madison uh, expertise, practitioners from the local area, and cultural mediators like Mark Loudon, who's able to, um, you know, not only speak Pennsylvania Dutch, but have the, the cultural capacity to you know, make bridges. And together, they um, work together to address some of the, the very important medical issues that are facing um, Amish children. And uh, it was a really uh, beautiful um, story. And one of the highlights of that experience was visiting the clinic. And one of the beautiful things of the clinic is they um, they service mostly, um, like I said, Amish and Mennonite families. And the care, not only have they shaped the care to make sure that they're meeting the cultural needs and the health needs, but also making sure that that care is also expressed in the environment. And so you see here, this is a birthing room. The, the sheets of the birthing room are welcoming and they're, um, they're patterned in a very homey way. Uh, you have um, Amish quilting that's very common um, with that community. The slide that I showed earlier, the interior of the clinic is uh, cladded with um, old barn wood. And so you are just feel, when you go to the clinic, you feel welcomed in the places that it makes sense. There's hardwood floors that were laid down by Amish men. Uh, outside the birthing room, there's a, a sliding glass door where, some, where an, uh, an Amish woman who is who's laboring, uh, ready to give birth, can also labor outside when the weather is nice, not when it's January and <laughs> the polar vortex is, is upon us. But in the summertime, in the warmer months, um, she can do her laboring outside. And so these types of um, uh, details, which seem just kind of like kind of funny details, actually really make <laughs> the service um, that they provide, the very important service that they provide, that much more um, welcoming and holistic. So that has been one of the highlights um, that participants um, have enjoyed. Uh, the next one, which was a new stop for us in 2019, the, the Sherman Phoenix in addressing unrest and redefining community wealth. So the Sherman Phoenix, um, if many of you might remember, in 2016, the, uh, the Sherman neighborhood in Milwaukee um, experienced um, great unrest following uh, a police um, shooting. And during the unrest, 
uh, the BMO Bank that's along Fond du Lac Avenue, one of the big diagonal um, avenues of Milwaukee, uh, was burned. And the community, after it was burned, the community said, like, what should we do with this building? This building has been here since the early 1920s. It's really, you know, can this be an important hub as we move forward and um, heal from this experience? And so uh, this picture doesn't capture, but it does capture um, one of the, the tenants of the Sherman Phoenix. So now the Sherman Phoenix, fast forward to um, 2019, is a vibrant uh, food hall, and um, it's, uh, it's home to a number of um, businesses owned and run by people of color who are from the neighborhood or, f or who are from Milwaukee. And so this is a very dynamic um, baker talking about the, um, how she came into to baking and how her uh, business is really uh, thriving and vibrant in this space. And so here we are, you know, meeting with those uh, business owners. And this is uh, Manan uh, Sabir, who runs with he and his wife Joanne run um, kind of the anchor tenant of the Sherman Phoenix. And he has his own uh, coffee, uh, thanks to uh, Colectivo, um, roasted a special coffee flavor um, for him. And the Shindig Cafe, which is the coffee shop that's anchoring that Sherman Phoenix. And again, that was a, a really um, bright. Uh, destination that we did and a favorite among folks. A next, another highlight is uh, Wisconsin Cranberries and Partners in Research. How many of you have been to a Cranberry Marsh? A bunch of you, great. Um, so this is, and so for many of our folks who are new to Wisconsin, new to um, especially central Wisconsin, many of them never had been to uh, a Cranberry Marsh. And one thing that I did learn, maybe you already knew this, I always um, say the word Cranberry, I said, I said, I, I said Cranberry Bog. But now that I work closely with uh, Wisconsin cranberry growers, in Wisconsin we say marsh. So do not say bog to uh, Wisconsin cranberry uh, growers. So they're marshes. So here we are in a cranberry bed um, talking with uh, the grower. We're at the Gottschalk cranberries here, and we're in one of their beds. Um, and it was a beautiful day. You can see how we travel. We travel uh, with badger coaches. And thanks to our uh, professor of geography, Kristen Anderson, he used his drone again for us to get a sense of the, just the, the scale of the cranberry growing enterprise. And here we are for scale. Here's 40 of us hanging out in that corner um, and where the water is in the relationship to water. And one of the reasons why we really enjoy going to Gacha Cranberry is um, expressing that really close relationship between cranberry growers and um, the expertise at UW-Madison. And this is Amaya Tucha, who is also relatively new to Wisconsin. She's Chilean, but she's now uh, Wisconsin's cranberry expert. And she and the Gottschalk family and other cranberry growers as well, um, she's really developed very strong bonds with Wisconsin growers to help them find the um, the aspects of cranberry growing that they want more research on and that helps shape the research that she does. And there's just a really positive um, feeling among uh, our extension and uh, the cranberry growers. And here I think you can see that warmth. And this is um, Guy Gottschalk who also um, served on the Board of Regents in the late 90s and early 2000s and endowed um, a position at in CALS and has been uh, a cranberry grower, his family's been growing cranberries for generations. So the next major highlight in recent years was in 2018 when we were thinking about uh, photography under the surface, healthy waters and healthy minds. Um, I was so excited to um, do this project and join hands with um, Northwest Passage, which is a mental um, health facility in northern Wisconsin who serves um, uh, teenagers and adolescents uh, going through um, mental health traumas. And one of the special projects that they did at Northwest Passage was thinking about the therapeutic value of water and the therapeutic value of getting out into nature. And so some years ago, they developed a program where um, you know, these uh, young people who are, who are looking for, you know, who are on their journey, giving them professional grade underwater camera equipment and training them, not just giving to them and <laughs> pushing them out of the boat, but giving them uh, um, the special high grade uh, photography equipment, teaching them how to use it and just letting them loose under the water and being in water, having that embodied experience with water and just being kind of that quiet, 
kind of solitude and beauty that you find in water um, has uh, given these students a way of, of expressing themselves and a way of finding um, health and healing on their journey. And the partners that we um, joined hands with at Northwest Passage, they gave us a very uh, beautiful um, tour of Houghton, um, Houghton Park, uh, which is outside of Washburn. And what was very beautiful about what they did was they wanted to have kind of nature and art together. And so as we walked on this forest um, trail, they had placed um, photographs that had been done by those students, the, the underwater photography um, uh, young people. And so here is one of our seminar participants holding our tour book that was uh, using one of the images of those of that young person. And here we are again at Houghton Falls. Uh, taking a photograph of some very beautiful water. And what was interesting about this trip was that the it was only maybe a 90 minute experience, but we got off the bus, it was very warm when we got off the bus, but as we like walked closer to Lake Superior, uh, it, was, it got colder and colder and it started um, kind of like ice raining. But by the time we got to the tip, it warmed up a little bit and you can't see it here, but there's a rainbow. So it's just a beautiful way of thinking about health and healing the therapeutic value of water and thinking about the work that, um, that Ian, Carl, and uh, Tobin and Francois do with young people on their journey to, to healthy minds. So that was uh, one of the highlights that year. And one of the other highlights, uh, again, of the Big Lake Tour of 2018 was stewardship of, the, of Manuman waters. And Manuman, um, which is the Ojibwe word for uh, wild rice. And we were welcomed by um, the Bad River Band of Ojibwe to, to get onto flat boats and get onto the Kagagan sloughs, which are the, the very lush wetlands in the southern shore of Lake Superior. So here we are visiting their hatchery um, after getting out on the water. And we joined hands with um, Bad River's uh, tribal historic preservation officer. And as we uh, moved on on boats, all 40 of us, um, she and others um, talked about the meaningfulness of those waters and the, the cultural significance and the just the food significance of those waters because if we can't keep these waters clean, um, we can't grow wild rice. And so they also t we also learned all the stewardship that has been going on to make sure that those waters are clean and they are able to harv do, do their annual harvest of wild rice. I think the final story I'm going to share super quickly is um, community partnerships of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's <coughs> Institute. And one of the, this is really one of the, the highlights. Uh, we visited, um, many of you may are aware of the Amazing Grace Chorus, which is a program of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. And the Amazing Grace Chorus um, brings together family members, um, <coughs> family members and their loved ones who are on the journey, uh, whether it's Alzheimer's or dementia, and they come together every Saturday to sing. Many of us know that when, when people um, are on the journey of dementia, oftentimes singing or is, a, is an expression that makes them feel alive, makes them come alive in, in different ways. And so this is one of, the, one of the members of that group. And not only do they meet every Saturday, but there's also other wraparound care that comes with being part of that program. And so. The, the folks at the Amazing Grace Chorus uh, um, honored us with a performance, and um, it was after a five-day you know, seminar experience, and the, one of the final songs was Amazing Grace, and it just really like, moved us, and it's kind of almost moving me right now, but it was, very, um, it was an honor to, to hear them and an honor to understand the role that music plays um, in their lives. And then I think this might be our last, um, our last quick story. Um, this one, Stories of Life, Land, and Refuge. So um, last year, our final experience together was in the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. Have, how many of you have been to the Kickapoo Valley Reserve? Hmm. It's a, destina oh, a destination for, uh, for next year, maybe. So the Kickapoo Valley Reserve is just this um, really beautiful, uh, uh, forest region in the Driftless area uh, outside of Lafarge and for um, time of memoriam it has been uh, a place where um, the Ho-Chunk has you have used as a, as a place of refuge and most recently um, Ho-Chunk has been doing a lot of work on, on prairie restoration and a number of water um, 
water stewardship initiatives to the point where um, here, um, Bill Quackenbush, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Ho Chunk, um, is showing the participants. Uh, it's not a secret stream, but you'd have to really know what you're looking for. Uh, and so he found a stream where people could fill their water bottles with clean water, um, even though the um, you know this space is also surrounded by um, you know dairies and other you know other enterprises you know surround. The, the Kikabu Valley Reserve, there's still pockets of clean, um, potable water that people can enjoy. And here um, is a photograph of one of the prairie restoration projects um, of the Ho Chunk Nation within the Kikabu Valley Reserve. And here's one of our participants. And let's see how we're doing on time. So, one of the, um, the aspects of the seminar that I really value is being able to say thank you to our collaborators. Um, every year we have 60 to 100 collaborators from across the state that help us make the seminar run and who share their expertise and their knowledge and energy with us. And so starting in 2017, I wanted to put together kind of gratitude bundles that showed um, and highlighted that UW Madison, um, you know, produces knowledge, but we also produce kind of the um, knowledge but in in beautiful ways and here is a um, what really is a, a rag rug but there are rag rugs that were uh, woven by volunteers at um, something called the weaving lab that was run by professor Marianne Fairbanks um, in the School of Human Ecology and she had this weaving lab at the WID for an entire summer in 2016 and 2017 where folks could come she had these large uh, floor weaving looms and people could could learn how to, to weave. And so we had a number of these just beautiful uh, rag rugs that were uh, you know, created in collaboration with others, which uh, for me, the, um, the metaphor was perfect. And we also had um, honey from the, the Department of Entomology and a comic book by a graduate student in School of Human Ecology who wrote the history of the Arboretum in, in comic form. And last year, we uh, piloted a project um, called the Water Cloths, where um, the same professor in the School of Human Ecology, Marianne Fairbanks, worked with her students. And each of her students um, chose um, kind of a pattern to create, I call them water cloths, but they're basically uh, towels. Um, but I wanted the students to be inspired by water, to be inspired by Wisconsin waterways. And so they wove um, these, just a, a, a rainbow of, of different uh, water cloths that we gave to our special collaborators um, helped us do the, the seminar. And this most recent year, we're doing the water cloth project again. And this year, we had those weaving students go on a special uh, walking tour of campus, um, a First Nations uh, cultural landscape walking tour to get give them a sense of the importance and the significance of the land and water on campus. And another project that we did this past year, I. Um, there was a, a cherry tree that had fallen um, in Eagle Heights. And I got a hold of a piece of that uh, cherry tree and um, gave it over to a graduate student in, um, the, in the art department who specializes in wood and wood carving. And he produced uh, a special cherry spoon for um, Bill Quackenbush, the, the a tribal historic preservation officer for the Ho Chunk Nation, and again, they, they're they're modest gifts, but they're a way for us to to express our uh, our gratitude and in humble ways, but in meaningful ways. <coughs> and so, um, so ideas together. So the um, so this is coming to the end of of my presentation and ideas together. Um, I'm hoping that you know the seminar when people get off the bus that they're inspired that they try to find ways that they can you know, integrate Wisconsin into the, the work that they do and think about ways that they can collaborate and be open to, to collaborations, whether it's between colleagues or people out of state. Um, so, so that's the Wisconsin Idea Seminar, as it exists today. <laughs> Does anyone have any, um, we have a few minutes for questions, anyone have any questions? Yes. So the question was, is there a similar program for um, state legislature, le legislators? And I feel like 
to answer that question, I feel like there is actually their own, they have a, their own bus tour um, where I, I've read that state legislators. I don't know if it's an annual thing, but they do. There's a bus involved, and there's travel around the state um, that's involved. Um, but one of the things that I've been thinking about, and, um, and if people here have ideas and want to um, share them with me uh, after the presentation, you know, looking for ways how do we engage um, our legislators, or how do we engage um, them, whether it's you know our participants just like listening to them and getting a sense of the you know the issues that that they're facing that they find. Um, are important, uh, but yeah, that's something that um, I'm very interested in, in thinking about and, and getting more advice about in future years. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, whether uh, people can do multiple Wisconsin IDEA seminars. Um, unfortunately, no, you can do one, um, one per career. Uh, there have been people that have done kind of like one and then they've been brought on as an expert and so they're engaging the seminar in those ways uh, but every year we have a long waiting list um, as might not have been clear um, earlier the as i mentioned the seminar is funded by the evie foundation and also by the schools and colleges from which the participants come from so that's how it's funded um, but it's really like one per career but yeah thank you Yes, that's a really good question. The question was about political diversity and how the seminar can expose um, or help engage participants in the uh, in the political diversity of Wisconsin. Um, as since I came on board, we haven't done that as explicitly. I know that um, some years ago, um, many of you uh, may have be familiar with Catherine Kramer's uh, book, The Politics of Resentment. And when she was doing some of her her research in Wisconsin, I think one of, one of my predecessors. Um, tapped her to to put together kind of a coffee clutch with some of her respondents and so I think in that way uh, participants were engaged um, maybe that's a little bit kind of what you're gesturing to but we haven't done an explicit um, program on that but I think that's something that's really important and maybe we can either address in a in a special reading or um, yes I haven't um, figured out how to do that yet um, any Yes. Are there any collaborative collaborative projects that have grown out of the Wisconsin Idea Tour? Yes. The university and people out there. That yes, there have, and I, I feel bad. I, I should have this like these memorized, but I know um, that there have been like our participants will like meet our hosts, and then they'll either start they'll they'll start some sort of conversation. I know that one of our um, botany participants ended up working with Oneida. On some projects, I can't think of like all the the um, the examples right off the top of my head, but there have been um, connections and reconnections. Yeah. The like I said, the seminar has been going on since 1985, and my predecessors have just done really amazing work keeping it alive um, and well all those years. And when I came on board, maybe partially for some of my perspectives, I wanted to make sure that um, we were you know, thinking about Wisconsin in diverse ways. And like historically, I think, um, like for our Native Nation visits, they've, they always had been kind of like a two hour experience. But I really wanted to make sure that we were expanding um, our experiences uh, with Native Nations and making it not just like another stop, but really like pausing in thoughtful ways. And so one of the new um, parts of that was having that cultural landscape walking tour in the beginning, like not even leaving campus without understanding the land where we do our work. And also um, hopefully creating like really thoughtful collaborations um, with the native, uh, with tribal leaders and others so that when we are visiting, we're um, highlighting the things that they want us to learn about and that they really want us to to be thinking about when we go back to to campus and so that has been really um, a really for me for me personally it's been uh, really a, a great learning experience but I think for the participants to be able to really like pause and have those experiences has been really helpful yeah Well, thank you, and, and I want to say too, like I'm going to be, um, you know, having a, having a bite to eat here, and I know all of you have spent really great careers at UW Madison, and so if you have ideas or suggestions for us of how you know, to 
to, you know, relying on your long-term knowledge of UW-Madison, like what would you want us to be including um, in the seminar? Are there ways that we should be thinking about the Wisconsin idea in new ways? Are there things that we should be interrogating the Wisconsin idea um, in different ways? And so as we, as we are, you know, having a bite to eat together, um, please feel free to let me know or, or take my card and email me because I, I would love to also um, inform my work with your long-term knowledge of UW-Madison. So thank you. And before, or before I go, I, sh I should mention too, um, I left some of the, our tour books here, so feel free to take a peek at some of the tour books. And I also wanted to highlight another one of our, um, I get so excited about our gratitude bundles, but I wanted to share with you um, a special notebook that uh, Mary Hark, that paper artist I mentioned, who's a, a professor in the School of Human Ecology, I had found these topographic maps at Science Hall. If I can quickly tell you a story. Um, the science hall was, uh, was cleaning out some spaces and there was a huge pile of topographic maps. And they're like, Kathleen, we don't know what to do with them. I'm like, may I have them? And they're like, uh, sure. And so uh, I quickly uh, gathered a, a bunch of them and I quickly contacted um, Mary Hart, the paper artist, and she ended up um, uh, ironing them out and creating these really um, beautiful notebooks lined with um, handmade paper and sewn together by hand which we gave um, to collaborators. Uh, and these are topographic maps that were used as teaching tools. So if you look closely, you can find the, you know, the pencil uh, scratches of students from the 50s and 60s who are learning about Wisconsin uh, topography and land. So this was another one of our, our gratitude items. So with that, thank you so much. And we thank you. Wow. Um, I do, I do. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> you